So some of you might have heard about the caste issue, which is which has been going on for the last two years at least. Um, and I often think, why you know why are we the targets? Of course, our panelists will also talk, but I will give my pitch. So we know that you know India is a highly highly diverse country. I don't know any other country more diverse than India, and most of us come from India. So India has dozens of languages, hundreds of dialects, distinct food habits, and thousands of gods and goddesses, which represent, you know, you can imagine any kind of religious and spiritual tradition you can think of. Uh, you know, that kind of diversity is there. We believe that this entire creation is interconnected. So we see the divinity. That's why I opened my remarks with namaste, which means, you know, I bow to the divinity within you. Now, a problem with this kind of attitude happens is we fail to see why would anybody target us? Because we mind our business in America, especially, you know, we are uh, immigration from India to America is mostly skilled immigration. Uh, so many of us are engineers, doctors, professors, of course, in corporate world. So why would anybody target such a community? And that's where I think our weakness comes. And partly it's because of our diversity. Uh, you know, because it's very difficult to unite the community. So, <clears throat> you know, the, the world is about perception. So it doesn't matter what the facts are. So we are under vicious attacks lately. Of course, we have been under attack for a long time, but I see in the last two years, in the name of caste, uh, you know, weaponizing of the caste and introducing caste as protected categories in the academia, in the corporate world, and even through legislative measures, uh, is becoming quite alarmingly, uh, you know, a problem for all of us. Now, when I talk to my friends and my colleagues, you know that okay, we are being accused of being caste discriminators. Actually, you know, their reaction is of disbelief. They say, "How is it possible?" You know, and it takes really a lot of time to convince them this is really happening because they are in denial, they don't know, and they don't see a possibility of this happening. And partly or mainly it is because this is not present in our diaspora. You know, we don't discuss caste. So I was talking to, I had two 20 year old son, one in early twenties, another late twenties. And um, my older one is quite liberal. He went to Berkeley. And I was telling him, them, both of them, other day that, you know, he was saying, what are you keeping you, what is keeping you busy these days, right? And on social front, other than research. I said, it's a caste. And I needed, I, I explained them a little bit. They say, by the, by the way, what is our caste? You know, and I'm sure many of the parents who are here or second generation, you will resonate that caste is, our kids don't even know what their caste is. So my younger son is in the university. He's a rising senior and, and he stayed last year with five, four other Indian boys in the dorm, in the, you know, in a private housing. And I asked him, do you ever discuss caste? He said, no, I, we don't even know what the last names of many of, of my friends really mean. We don't even know where they come from in India. In fact, my last name is Kumar. So it, it is not a caste name. So this is a common experience. And yet we are being, you know, labeled as caste oppressors and as privileged, you know, we, we worked hard through ranks to get into America through skilled immigration. And many of us took loans. When I immigrated to America after my PhD, I did not have money for buying plane ticket. I took, I borrowed money from my wife's uncle and I repaid it after I started getting my salary in America. And then we are told that we are privileged somehow. So it is our hard work, which has gotten us where we are. So this is something for our community to think over, and that's the purpose of this panel. So now I will, you know, just end my, um, you know, opening remarks with one uh, sentence that perception is what matters. Actually, you know, people don't have time to look at the facts to dig out the facts, and this is the perception war we have not cared for, we have not worked on, and this is our opportunity. This challenge is our opportunity to educate not only ourselves, our future generations, but also larger American public and the lawmakers about the reality where the facts are. Okay. So now I would invite um, Attorney Sohak Shukla 
to give her remarks. What I'll do is kind of set the broad contours legally um, in terms of this issue of, of weaponizing caste. So the first thing I want to address is what is affirmative action? And I think you'll hear me making distinctions between American law and Indian law. And I do that because the vast majority of our community are, are immigrants. And so they might be more familiar with the Indian law. And I think it's important to understand some of the distinctions. I'm by no means an expert on Indian law, but know enough on certain topics that I can at least broadly uh, make comparisons. So the first thing is what's affirmative action? So in the US, affirmative action describes either a set of policies or programs that are intended to expand access to educational and economic opportunities to historically excluded groups. Um, affirmative action, you could say, is the same thing even in India. Um, in the United States, these groups include um, racial, ethnic, and religious minorities, women, people with disabilities, LGBT individuals, and sometimes veterans. Um, affirmative action can be viewed largely as kind of twofold. One is there's an aim to eliminate discrimination as a means of um, expanding access, right? Because discrimination is a way of keeping people out. Um, so when we look at laws like the Civil Rights Act of 1964, so if you are an employee, um, your HR department may have told you about Title VII. Title VII prohibits discrimination in the workplace. If you're on a college campus and you're a student, something like Title VI would protect against um, discrimination uh, on those campuses receiving federal funding um, or state universities. And uh, in addition to the statutory law, um, such as the Civil Rights Act of 1964, you also have broad constitutional principles like equal protection, um, which is what it sounds like, that everyone should be treated equally under the law, and due process, which um, is a more complex topic. But if I were to boil it down um, to a nutshell, it's kind of an overarching notion of fairness, that law should be fair so that citizens have clear notice of what's expected of them and states can't overreach or abuse power um, and deny um, civil rights of its citizens. And, um, and then there's obviously state law as well, state constitutions, state statutes. And so these are the ways in which affirmative action plays out in its aim to eliminate discrimination. The second prong of affirmative action is also to correct past discrimination. So you might see this as um, targeted scholarships or recruitment programs, certain grants that are given to minority business owners are all you know, um, examples of how there's a, a means to try to correct past discrimination. Um, now in India, uh, many of you are familiar with the reservation system. That is a quota system that's intended to um, reverse or um, pass discrimination and to bring people greater access to educational and economic opportunities as well as political representation. In the United States, quotas, however, have been ruled unconstitutional. However, membership in a historically excluded group may be a consideration, meaning that it can put a finger on the scale in say things like college applications um, or uh, when they're considering it. So that's kind of overarching what affirmative action is. So I wanna talk a little bit more about protected class because anytime we're talking about um, caste, the next few words is they're trying to add caste as a specific or a standalone protected class. So what does protected class mean? The term protected class refers to groups of people who are legally protected from being harmed or harassed by laws, practices, or policies that discriminate against them due to a shared characteristic. So what might these be? Race, gender, religion, age, disability, sexual orientation. Um, these are all different kinds of protected classes. And the, the courts have ruled the burden um, for each one of them differently. So for instance, 
race and uh, or national origin, those um, are um, treated probably with greater seriousness than things like um, gender. Uh, just that's the way the case law has fallen. Um, and you see these protected classes pop up in both federal law, state law, as well as institutional policies. So when we're talking about caste being added as a protected class, what does that mean legally? So caste, and why is it a problem? Caste, if you look at, first of all, all the other protected classes, race, gender, national origin, ancestry, any of those, they're what's called facially neutral, meaning that they can apply to anyone. You could arguably be a white Caucasian employee working in an all Asian department. And if you have a manager who's perhaps withholding opportunities for you because of your race, you could arguably have a claim uh, for, for race-based discrimination, meaning there's no presumed uh, victim and no presumed uh, perpetrator. Um, and that's what's meant by facially neutral. It can apply to anyone. Caste, however, would be the first facially discriminatory class that's being added, whether it's to uh, county policy, as we saw in Santa Clara, corporate policy, as we're seeing being pushed at Google, university policy, as we're seeing not just at CSU, which has 23 campuses, but UC Davis, Harvard, Brandeis, and a number of other schools. So what the problem here is, is that it's institutionalizing what is perhaps the most entrenched false and negative stereotype about our community. And one, a, a, a stereotype and a term that is exclusively associated with Indians and more specifically Hindus. And when I say that, I mean that with great seriousness. I mean, if we look at the state of California, one of the content standards for learning about India is learn about the caste system. So it starts from a very young age in terms of embedding this association, close association, false equivalency between India, Hinduism, and caste. So that's why we say that caste is then facially discriminatory in that just on its face, if you go um, and ask any administrator, well, who is this caste category gonna apply to? It's only going to apply to Indians and Hindus. So um, that makes it facially discriminatory. The other problem is with the addition of caste is, and I won't go into too much detail, is that in the absence of any evidence of caste-based discrimination ever having occurred at CSU, as both Sunilji and Pravinji will attest to from their conversations with the, the administration, as well as um, the president of the Cal State Faculty Association, which is the faculty union, they couldn't name a single um, case that had been filed or complaint that had been alleged. So if there hasn't been a allegation and you haven't tested existing law, <clears throat> look, no one should be discriminated against. And if, especially because of something in their background, if they are, the fact is that caste, which first of all has no agreed upon definition, entails things like ancestry, culture, background, um, clan, tribe, all of these different things. All of those things are already protected under national origin and ancestry, but they haven't even tested the existing law to say, okay, caste isn't covered or we can't extend protection to caste. So the only thing then that is propelling this is also a discriminatory intent. And what that discriminatory intent is, is that there's a presumption that somehow South Asians and Indians as a subset, Hindus as even a sub-subset, are so inherently depraved, so inherently discriminatory, bigoted, prejudiced, et cetera, that they merit a special category that's gonna single them out for basically a perverted version of ethno-religious um, policing and targeting. This is textbook discrimination. So we're talking also, broadly speaking, a population, our population makes up less than 1.3% of the entire U.S. population. Um, and I'll just end because I want to keep my remarks brief and I'm sure we'll get into more with all the questions, is 
when we talk about discrimination, because oftentimes what happens in our community conversations, we have to acknowledge the fact that much of what we know of ourselves and oftentimes the way we talk about our society is still through a colonized consciousness because of the English, British English education system, because of prevalent narratives that have been framed by uh, the British colonial Raj, as well as German Indologists. And so oftentimes we'll say, oh yeah, we, we, there's a lot of discrimination in our community and people are talking about same marriage um, or something like that. So I think we need to be very um, strict in how we use language. And so I want to just talk about four concepts, stereotype, preference, prejudice, and discrimination. And what do those all mean? So a stereotype is a specific belief or assumption, and it can be either positive or negative about individuals based solely on their membership in a group, regardless of their individual characteristics, right? So saying that caste is something that is central to every Indian and Hindu person's identity is a stereotype. When you talk about caste being a discriminatory hierarchical system, it's also a negative stereotype. The second thing is prejudice, and prejudice is a negative attitude or feeling towards other individuals based solely on their membership in a particular group. I don't like uh, Punjabis, I'll just say that, right? That is a prejudice, but as long as I'm not acting out on that prejudice, it remains within the realm of prejudice. Discrimination is something very specific. It's when you act on your prejudiced attitudes. But in the legal sense, discrimination occurs in specific contexts, namely employment, housing, public accommodations, meaning restaurants or hotels, as well as education. And that is um, when you act upon a prejudiced attitude towards someone based on their membership in a group. And the last thing is preferences. And this is something that all humans engage in and humans engage in all the other practices as well. But preferences are your likes or dislikes, and they can be anywhere. I mean, there's no real judgment. If you have a preference for chocolate ice cream over vanilla, there's no real objective or subjective measure um, in terms of determining what those preferences are. So I think it's important to um, think about these four different things as we talk. So especially with our kids, or if our kids are talking to us, to make those discussions, um, distinctions. So for instance, where this comes up very frequently is if say as parents, you prefer that your child marry someone within your own linguistic group. That's not discriminate, discriminating against others because what happens within marriage doesn't fall within the purview of what is legal or unlawful, unlawful discrimination. We're talking about preferences there. Now, if you go a step further to say, well, I only want you to wear, marry someone from this linguistic group because those are those people in this language group are this way, X, Y, Z, then you are articulating a prejudice. So it's a subtle difference, but I think it's important for us to be um, very careful in the language that we use. So that's my overview. So now I will invite Professor Praveen Sinha to share his views specifically related to what is the climate in the university like nowadays and how are the discrimination issues handled in the university system thank you thank you sanilji thank you everyone for coming and thank you so hard for the <clears throat> setting laying down the background um, so let me briefly talk about the university climate in general uh, universities are very protective places for children uh, these are pretty much the freshmen who come to campus are pretty much first time out of their homes. Universities go out of it to make sure that they're all, you know, safe, taken care of, and they are not subjected to anything which is going to hurt them in any way, physically or emotionally or mentally. And that is the top priority of all administration and all faculty members. We know that and we look at the students in that fashion. Most of us who are slightly beyond a certain age group can easily relate to these students with their own children because they have gone to college. So it's pretty safe place for all practical purposes. Uh, when students come in, they are also provided a safety net in the campus through different procedures. For example, every undergraduate has an advisor, academic advisors, but the students tend to know them well and they can sometimes talk to them issues 
beyond the academic selection of courses also. Uh, but that's not the formal channel. There are also assistant deans at university in every, every college who are available to students for any issues that they may be confronting, sometimes minor, sometimes courses, sometimes scheduling, what have you. But there is a good amount of communication that students can have with the administration. In the case of a formal complaint of something that requires serious attention, every university has something called the Dean of Students, uh, which is an important position, very well-staffed and well-funded position, uh, headed by a you know, professional who has got a very large staff. The students can go there, bring up the issues. And the Dean of Students tend to be the advocate for the students. Whether it's a great issue, whatever may be the issue, they will advise them, keeping their well-being in, uh, into consideration. And if it is a serious case of a discrimination of the type Sohag alluded to, you know, based on gender, religion, uh, race, what have you, uh, then there is always an Office of Diversity Equity, we call the DEI in short. And these are highly skilled individuals who are trained in this. They are HR professionals. They listen to the students. It's a safe environment, absolutely safe. Students can say anything they want to say there, and that will never be used against them. And to give you a sense, uh, the budget for Ohio State, which is the data I was able to get for this office, is a total of $13 million, $13 million budget for Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. That is how large that office is, and that is reflective of the total salary, compensation, and uh, benefit that they receive. So keep in mind, all the big universities make a huge investment. And I had the misfortune of being to that office once, only once in my life, over uh, you know close to three decades of experience. Uh, I never had an issue, but I had to go there once. And it was, I must say, it was highly, highly professionally handled by them from both the student and my perspective. And that is what we expect in most of the instances. So to, to put into, you know, summarize, there is a lot of support structure available to students and there are sufficient protections for even smaller things. And there's also psychological counseling centers available on every campus if the student is having some psychological problems. Second will be uh, how are discrimination issues. Let, let me talk briefly about where the discrimination issue can come about. Because, you know, you send your children to school, uh, to college, university campuses, and you have to wonder where this can happen. But it can happen in a lot of different ways. Uh, one most obvious one is if a student has a grade dispute and they think that the grade is not fair uh, and the faculty is discriminating against them and assigning them a grade, which is actually the most common one, believe it or not. And there are procedures on campus for grade appeal. There is a grade appeals committee at the college level and there's a grade appeals committee at the university level. The student can resolve the matter at the college level. If they're not happy, they can take it to the university level. And these are all committees composed of faculty members, and they also have a student in them, just to make sure that the process is fair and that the student point is also heard. <clears throat> um, in these cases, uh, in the case of a grade, the discrimination issue can come in if there are some subjective factors, like class participation or something which is based on not so easily quantifiable measure. And in that case, a discrimination case can be made. Uh, it depends on the university. Some universities, the students are very concerned about their grade. When I was at Cornell, I knew that when the date drop deadline came, the students will start hovering around my office. Am I going to get an A in your class or not? And if I'm not, I'm dropping it because that was the pressure they had on the grades. So grades can lead to issues, especially in high-stress schools. Uh, but by and large, students are pretty understanding of what they're getting. They know what they're put in and what they deserve. So that's the great part. But if uh, their subjectivity is great, can be taken to a higher level and a discrimination case can be filed. Okay. Uh, then the second category comes in, which is a thing that I had a misfortune or whatever you want to say, of being very heavily involved in is academic integrity. I was chair of the Academic Integrity Committee at the university for four years and I ended up writing their whole academic integrity code of conduct. Uh, academic integrity means che lying, cheating, or what have you whenever you submit your assignment or do your exam. Uh, in that case also, you can have instances in which a 
a student may make a claim that the faculty was, you know, discriminating against them in terms of why they accused them and not others and what have you. So those are second categories. And I never had a case in which a discrimination lawsuit was, discrimination case was filed by a student on the basis of gender, race, sex, what have you. And I was on that committee for four years. I heard every case uh, and it is done very fairly and always keeping student well-being in mind. We don't care about much more about anything except the student well-being. So I don't need to go into that policy, but students in general accept what is done in that committee because it is done you know, with preponderance of evidence. It's not simply somebody guessing it. The third category where I think the real problem will come in is will be faculty evaluations. Uh, in universities, <clears throat> Uh, there is a system of tenure, which means when the faculty finish their PhD and join the university, they are given a temporary position, which is subject to review. And if the review process goes fairly, after six to seven years, they get tenure. Tenure means a job for life, which means after that, you cannot be fired. And during the, from the date of appointment till the date of tenure, they have to go through rigorous evaluations. And these are done by faculty committees, usually senior faculty members whose job, who are experienced and whose job is to review the entire file of the candidate, both in terms of the teaching, research, service, and then make an assessment whether this person should, person should be promoted, given tenure, retained, or be fired. I was chair of that committee for four years at uh, my current institution. It's a very, very serious responsibility. And in... Uh, it's done, it's done very, very uh, objectively, I would say, and I have been very comfortable in what we've done. Uh, but it is not uncommon for these cases to be challenged. Because once you are denied tenure, that is effectively getting fired. People sometimes find it hard to take it. They have a lot of invested capital in themselves. They've done a lot of work. They believe they deserve it. And... Sometimes it's not easy for faculty to take that. So what do they do in that case? They try to find somebody like Sohag and say, can we have a case against the university so that we can challenge them? And can we basically try to get a tenure legally? So taking a legal path is not uncommon, not uncommon at all, especially in top universities, it does happen. And they can go through arbitration process, whatever it is, but when the lawyers come in, the first question is asked, what is your case? Why are you claiming that the decision made by the tenure committee is wrong? And you can say, well, their evaluation of my research is not correct, this and that. And then sometimes, and it has happened in my knowledge, somebody may say, because I have a different race than the committee members and they are racist. And it has happened actually, I've seen that happen. And uh, those cases can get very tricky at times. But as Swag mentioned earlier, race, everybody has a race. When this kind of policy will be put into place uh, in CSU systems, and supposing I'm the chair of the committee and I'm, al and I'm evaluating a file of an Indian, you know, somebody of Indian origin, and if I issue an opinion which is negative, which we do all the time, it is not uncommon to be that to be done then I would be the sole target on that lawsuit because they can say, you belong to a different caste. I have a different caste. You are discriminating towards me on the base of my caste. Just a disclaimer here, I belong to no caste. I've asked my grandmother, everybody in the family, nobody has been able to tell me which of the four castes we belong to. So I belong to a, a jati, which we call caste, but caste apparently don't fit to, into any of those four just as a disclaimer. So to just summarize it, we can have these issues come in and the net result will always be, it will be negative. Uh, and you know, it, it will basically, it's like sowing seeds of weed in a field. We will, there'll be more fights, there'll be more uh, disagreements. And I think this is not going to be any good. So far, we have not seen much of that, but once a weapon is given, I have no reason any lawyer will not use it. If it can work for you, why not use it? So we'll, we'll see these things coming up as this policy becomes effective and as the time progresses. So um, I'm going to stop here now. I think I've taken enough time. Let's move on to, to the rest of personality. It's all yours. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, uh, 
so hardly i will you know i would like to add two three examples you know this whole thing in csu started with a student resolution so the csu system has a system wide student body that's where i got involved and there were four or five students who co-authored a resolution which was picked up ditto from equality labs uh, you know narrative and one of those only two students were of indian origin remaining two or three were hispanic or uh, you know caucasian students and before their vote last year i got a chance to talk to all five of them over zoom you know i requested a meeting before their vote and they agreed to meet and i really asked them you know what is it which is bothering them and one of the example one student gave of indian origin said professor when we go to the temple i mean when a dalit goes to a temple the priest would ask the dalit to remove the shirt to show the sacred thread in america now all of you who are present in this meeting you would you know you will be you will be laughing at it but don't laugh you know be really serious because it's very vicious so i asked this student he was a sikh student i say you are not even a hindu from your last name i know you are a sikh and you are a jat sikh and you are speaking about temple have you ever gone to the temple he said professor there is a discrimination in our gurudwaras i said then talk about that in the in the in the resolution don't talk about hindus when you don't even go to the temple and i said how is it possible that they would ask someone to remove the shirt you know to bear the upper part i said would they do the same thing with the ladies or only the upper caste lower caste men are not allowed and ladies are allowed it is so ridiculous right but people buy it sometimes out of their motivation another times because they don't dig deeper they think oh this is a problem and we should fix it second case recently has happened in the cisco case and they were you know and some of you might have read in the newspapers if you have they saying oh sundar piche is a brahman and that's why he is privileged and he is doing it i mean come on do we get positions do i become professor in the university or someone becomes a president of organization chairman of organization like google ceo because someone is a brahman i mean in america so so we can you know we can just wonder why is it happening but certainly those forces who are behind it they are very very motivated and they are very vicious actually there is a reason they are doing it for right they they see the benefit and i was talking to one political strategist who i respect a lot a non indian i said why is it happening and he knows it is happening and he said it happens with my community also and he said you know this is to make america unwelcoming to indians because you guys are too successful here so that was his take so there are larger you know forces and larger design behind it